Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Today, we're joined by Tim Yurka, head of Feed AI at LinkedIn. As you can imagine, Feed AI is responsible for curating all the content you see daily on the LinkedIn site. What's less apparent, though, to those that don't work on this type of product is the wide variety of opposing factors that need to be considered in organizing and optimizing the feed. As you'll learn in our conversation, this challenge is what Tim calls the holistic optimization of the feed, and we discuss some of the really interesting technical and business issues associated with trying to do this. In particular, we talk through some of the specific techniques used at LinkedIn, like multi-arm bandits and content embeddings. And we also jump into a really interesting discussion about how to organize for machine learning at scale. Before we get going, I'd like to send a huge thanks to LinkedIn for sponsoring today's show. LinkedIn engineering solves complex challenges at scale to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. AI and ML are integral aspects of almost every product the company builds for its members and customers. LinkedIn's highly structured data set gives their data scientists and researchers the ability to conduct applied research to improve member experiences. To learn more about the work of LinkedIn engineering, visit engineering.linkedin.com slash blog. And now on to the show. All right, everyone. I am here with Tim Yurka, head of Feed AI at LinkedIn. Tim, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thanks for having me. Uh, I've listened to a lot of your episodes, so it's it's great to be here on the show. Fantastic. Uh, I am really looking forward to diving into some of the ways that you use AI to optimize the LinkedIn feed. But before we do that, how did you get started working in AI? Um, via a pretty circuitous route, I think. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> that's less surprising than you may think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Uh, so I, my, my undergraduate, actually, I started in political science, um, and, uh, I could really not decide between political science and computer science. Okay. Um, and I was very fortunate to, um, stumble upon a research assistantship kind of halfway through undergrad with, uh, with a professor at Davis, uh, Amber Boydston, who was doing a lot of computational social science. Um, and to their credit, political scientists have basically been aggregating news for the last several decades and annotating it manually uh, uh, with research assistants. So they had these massive code books, massive quantities of data um, that were all manually annotated. You know, like this is about uh, the war in Iraq. This is uh, about like the economy, on and on and on. Um, and it seems like a perfect solution for machine learning, right? Uh, this is like you have you have the data there. Um, and so we started working together. We wrote some uh, tools uh, in R to start doing text classification um, and basically classifying millions of news articles over the course of the last 60 years into all these categories um, with the goal being, can we start looking at uh, how the American electorate's issue priorities have changed over time? Uh, so this is kind of like a dynamic trend over time. You know, What do people care about and how does the media influence what they care about in American politics? Um, so it was a really interesting intersection of, I think, computational social science or, or political science and computer science um, that really turned me on to machine learning and AI. Um, and I actually continued, uh, I started doing my PhD in political science uh, also with uh, Amber at UC Davis. Um, and that kind of continued for a few years uh, until um, some personal family circumstances caused me to leave the program. Um, and I had to find a job to pay the bills. Uh, and I stumbled across a startup called Pulse, uh, which was an RSS aggregator. And it was uh, it was really just a perfect fit uh, when Akshay, the CEO of Pulse, uh, talked to me and asked me to join uh, the, the, as their first machine learning engineer. He was like, "We're an RSS aggregator. We're aggregating millions of articles uh, like every single day, and we want you to basically classify these into categories and start personalizing people's uh, news news reading experience." Uh, and so it was like the perfect fit of what I had been doing already in graduate school um, within the industry. So. While at Pulse, we built up uh, the first recommendation system, um, and I did not spend much time there. Uh, within four months, we had been acquired by LinkedIn, um, and that's how I entered LinkedIn. Uh, so that uh, that's a quite circuitous route to actually make my way into LinkedIn and into AI. Um, once here, uh, we started redesigning the Pulse app, and the really cool thing I think about LinkedIn data was the fact that we could use 
the news content that we were ingesting and the, the economic graph data, and we could start generating insights. And so these insights, you actually see them today in the LinkedIn feed because they eventually made their way out of the Pulse app into the main LinkedIn feed. But you can say, hey, here's stuff that's trending in your industry. Uh, these, are, these are news insights you will not get on other social networks because we have that kind of standardized data about where are people working, what are their skills. So we introduced a bunch of these kind of what we call uh, in intelligent insights into the feed, um, trending in your industry, trending at your company, like what are people reading uh, in aggregate and what might you be missing? Um, so that's how I started working on the, the LinkedIn feed. Yeah, I think that most folks are probably familiar with the feed at the from a user perspective. And one of the things that you and I were chatting about before we got started was this kind of broader challenge of what you called holistic optimization of the feed, right? Uh, which seems like a, an interesting place to kind of jump in talking about some of the challenges that you're working with. When, when you say holistic optimization of the feed, what does that mean? Yeah, so... I use the term holistic because whenever I go to a conference or like I'm presenting our work, a lot of the people that are are in this space, like building recommender systems, they're still thinking about the like nation stages of their problem. And so they're saying like, hey, let's like sort by CTR or or some like uh, simple metric, right? Like let's just show the most uh, likely stuff that somebody's going to click on at the top of, of whatever they're building, at the, their feed, like an ad, whatever it might be. Um, and... Uh, I think the feed definitely started there, but uh, we started identifying a lot of different actors. There's so many different reasons that people come to the feed, right? You may be coming to look for a job. You may be coming to learn a LinkedIn learning skill. Um, you may be coming to read content or build an audience. Um, and all these all these actors in the feed have a different different intent. And when we talk about holistic optimization, it's really understanding those in individual intents and making them work together. So uh, in addition to, for example, sorting the feed for engagement and showing the most engaging content at the top, we may also want to say, you know, what incentivizes a creator on LinkedIn? Uh, why are they visiting? And they're likely visiting to connect to an active community, to connect to an audience and, and build their brand. And if they post, like if you came to LinkedIn right now and, and you shared a, a, a link and explained the latest Twimmel um, podcast episode topic and nobody engaged with that, that would not feel great. And it probably wouldn't be a really good incentive for you to come back to LinkedIn. Um, and so we want to incentivize. We, we, we don't necessarily want to just incentivize the hyper viral actors on LinkedIn that get, you know, a lot. they have a lot of influence already. We also want to incentivize new creators on the platform and encourage them to come back again and again. Um, when I say holistic op optimization, these things are sometimes in in contradiction with each other. Optimizing for engagement and optimizing for like creator side value sometimes work in contrast to each other um, because sometimes you will sacrifice some engagement uh, to give a creator a bit more attention with the intent that longer term they will want to come back and, and connect with that audience that they've discovered on LinkedIn. Um, and so these kinds of problems, there, there's several of them within the LinkedIn feed. The creator kind of consumer side is, is mm -hmm. one, one form of holistic optimization. Um, I think the other one is uh, what happens after you have engaged with your feed or created a conversation in the feed. Um, so somebody created something, you may have left a comment. How did that impact your downstream network? Were you able to in impact your second and third degree uh, network to participate in that conversation? Um, that is also like part of this holistic uh, optimization equation. Um, and then there's some more traditional kind of trade-offs when you consider holistic optimization when it comes to things like uh, revenue and engagement. Um, so this is a pretty well-known problem is, you know, ads are not as engaging as organic content. Um, and if you completely optimize for revenue in the short term, you might actually be sacrificing like folks who want to come back long term if they just saw more organic engaging content. Uh, and that has much more value over the, over the lifetime of, of a member using LinkedIn. Um, and so you really can't be uh, short sighted when doing kind of a holistic optimization. You, you can't just focus on like short term revenue or short term engagement. You really need to create um, these retention funnels that people have built an active community. They want to come back and, and get insights from that community on LinkedIn uh, and not just exploit kind of a short term optimization. When I hear what you're saying, I think of, you know, some optimization function with you know, a bunch of different components, right? You know, but then I think of a whole, you know, different set of challenges around, you know, really understanding what those components should be and mm -hmm. thinking about like how to weight them, you know, more um, things that are closer to like the business side and, and the, you know, the vision of what you're trying to create for the service. How do you apportion or think about the relative, you know, challenge of those different aspects? 
it's exactly the kinds of problems that we've had to tackle over the last three years. And I think uh, there's two solutions, right? There's like a technical solution and there's also uh, kind of a, a product or business-based solution, as you mentioned, which is if you have strong opinions about how your business should operate, you can actually give the individual components of optimizing these different parts of the ecosystem and allow somebody who has you know really good product intuition, understands the business really well, to weight them. Uh, that's like the simplest uh, non-technical way to, to handle this. Um, but when you actually uh, when you actually get into the technical solutions, there there are a lot of interesting um, techniques that can be used to balance between these different objectives. Um, we've started with things like multi arm bandits uh, to start tuning between these different objectives and finding kind of a sweet spot um, by exploring a bunch of different arms and seeing like you know which one is most promising. And we still have to have some human intervention in terms of which arm we finally choose, but uh, it helps us understand the the trade off space. Um, and that starts getting a bit more into the, the technical space. Um, I think if you go even farther, and it's just some, somewhere LinkedIn uh, has not gotten yet, but you can start using neural nets to, to um, understand all the different players in the ecosystem and understand how to balance between those different incentives. Um, and that's something that we're starting to look at in terms of reinforcement learning um, right now to solve this kind of problem of how do you balance between all these different objectives. And the multi arm bandit side, when you're applying that kind of approach, how are you kind of structuring that problem? So it's really like we take the traditional example of like revenue engagement trade off, which we talked about earlier. I think there's a strong opinion that in engagement is the best way to long term uh, bring a member back to LinkedIn, right? And so uh, in, in our case, in, in FDI's case, we're really focused on can we continue to grow the organic and kind of engagement ecosystem um, while keeping revenue healthy? And so you set some constraints to your multi arm bandit to explore a space by which it's either keeping uh, revenue flat or slightly positive um, while trying to maximize engagement, both short term and long term engagement. Um, and so it's actually kind of a constrained problem. So you're, you're not fully letting it go off and make a decision for you. But it's we're specifically applying these techniques in in the in in an individual kind of trade off problem within the ecosystem. So we're not yet trading off between like three or four objectives uh, with one system, right? We're making trade offs between these pairwise um, objectives. So then, how do you then map that to the three or four different? Is it a hierarchical type of approach where you're using the multi arm bandit to kind of define the trade off between engagement and revenue. And then, you know, for a particular kind of value of engagement, you then have other systems or, you know, kind of hier hierarchically apply multi arm bandit or, you know, uh, some multiple um, components to an objective function, like determine how you trade off the un the underlying things that contribute to engagement or so we am I thinking about the you are, problem you're space thinking, in the right yeah, way? Yeah, you're thinking about it exactly in the right way. And um, it comes down to, you know, we, we have to set constraints that are informed by this kind of business and product opinion uh, to the problem that's being solved by the, the, the multi-arm bandit solution, right? So we may say, uh, let's keep revenue like flat and let's like focus a bit more on engagement. Um, and then there's the creator side of the equation. And we'll say, uh, we actually want to, uh, up to some limit, we want to incentivize creators. So we give the the system a kind of budget to explore solutions by which it can incentivize creators and still move engagement forward. Um, and similarly, when we look at downstream, there's like the same kind of constraint is is put in place, which is like, can you move downstream engagement without affecting a, a viewer's engagement within a given session? So can you still get keep them engaged with their feed, but like like lengthen their impact down the down the chain of like second and third degree uh, connections? So it's not a purely kind of unsupervised problem here. We are mm -hmm. definitely introducing some product thinking and, and and opinions as to like what the constraints should be, and letting the system explore solutions there, which is. That's the exploration part is really what I think humans are not good at, uh, like reasoning the about the various trade offs once you've put some constraints in place. And so that's where I think these kind of techniques are super helpful in in finding that balance to how how do we holistically optimize across all these different objectives with some opinions on what the constraints should be in that ecosystem. And so does a big part of making this actually usable, relate to the kind of interface between the the systems and the folks that are responsible for kind of managing this trade-off and the objectives and kind of what does that look like? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a very kind of tight coupling between 
the AI team, the infrastructure teams, the product teams that, that build all this. All, like our entire feed product team is is very familiar with AI techniques and how they how they think about the role AI plays in the products and and how to trade off between different objectives. I think we don't have to change the the balance very frequently, right? We, we, we set forth a strategy in terms of what we want the ecosystem to look like. And we really design our system around like, can you optimize given this strategy and given the constraints that, that you know, our product partners have, have laid out? Um, and that does not change very frequently. Of course, the system has to constantly adapt because the models change. And so it has to constantly recalibrate kind of how much weight you're giving to each, each model. Um, but the actual underlying strategy will mainly remain in place, you know, over time. So you don't have to adapt that is the the approach that we're talking about where you're using multi arm bandit to uh balance between a couple of metrics and then within that space kind of optimize and even uh, as I'm talking about it, it's still fuzzy like how do we get to the next level of, of detail here and make it a little bit more concrete yeah um so i think it's good to think about it in terms of uh we have a lot of different objective functions with uh, with trade-off parameters in in the broader optimization, right? So the, the broader optimization function can be, for example, um, we have your viewer side engagement, we have uh, the creator side value, and we have some trade-off between those two. We have uh, the revenue engagement or, or the revenue component. We have a trade-off for that component and downstream impact. All of these have different tunable parameters in terms of how much weight we give each of these objectives. Um, and so what's really difficult is finding the right balance across, say, those four objectives um, while meeting the constraints that, that we've laid out in terms of, you know, we don't want to drop revenue. We want to continue to provide creator value within some realm. Um, and so what the multi arm bandit really helps is it, it can explore all, all the different kind of trade-off variations for these four different objectives and then propose a, a few that actually will... Um, will meet the constraints and the criteria that we've laid out in accordance with the strategy. Um, so really what it comes down to is, is can, can we explore space and, and identify a set of, let's say, four trade-off parameters that meet all the constraints that, that we've identified? Mm -hmm. um, and so that requires essentially setting up a system that for different, different parts of the population on, on LinkedIn is trying different variations of the parameter and seeing what the outcome is. Like, how is this impacting the revenue metric? How is this impacting uh, the engagement metric or downstream metric? And then uh, getting a readout and a gradient across like a bunch of different parameters. Hey, you may have just answered my next question, uh, which is, is this, are you applying the multi-arm bandit as a way to um, explore on kind of live interactions, or are you doing it in simulation and using that to determine model parameters that you deploy out to prod? There's two ways we do this, right? So um, for individual objectives, some of them are actually quite predictable offline, right? We can we can predict whether our models are doing a better job of, say, starting a conversation um, mm -hmm. purely via offline simulation, because when we train our models, um, we basically will uh, compare it to like a randomized uh, a randomized list of updates that a member has seen um, via like unbiased data collection. And we'll basically see, does this new model actually lift items that they've clicked on like higher up? And so via offline simulation, we can basically tell uh, replaying on old data, hey, you know, like this is this model is actually more likely to start, start conversations. When it comes to things like uh, revenue, it's much more difficult to simulate offline because you have so many moving uh, parts around like seasonality, around like uh, supply and demand of, of the ads ecosystem. And so those are really things that you have to adapt live online once you've kind of shipped the, the model to production. And so um, it's a dual answer, right? Offline for the objectives where we can actually replay on historical data where there isn't a lot of these confounding factors, we will ship those models online. And then for those that we can't, we will tune via the multi-arm bandit system uh, between the different objectives. Um, because our primary goal is like, can we get people to form active communities and start conversations? Um, that is the primary objective that we can simulate offline and it's like what what we base a lot of our like ship decisions on like have we have we enabled people to start more conversations uh does this model do a better job at that if so bring it online and then let's find how to tune for the other constraints that we've imposed on the ecosystem um, rather than trying to solve all the problems all at once uh offline mm -hmm. so engagement is is really conversations like starting conversations incentiv incentivizing creators that's really the seed of where we start 
kind of the the optimization. And you mentioned reinforcement learning as a potential future direction in this area. Yeah. What's um, how do, would you see it applied here? So I think it's still super early days. So I, I don't know how much detail I would go in here, but if you can define kind of the the action space and and the the different actors uh, in the ecosystem, um, you could potentially set up a, a problem that um, can be more holistically optimized in terms of. Uh, rather than manually tra training each objective individually, you can actually uh, optimize for all the objectives simultaneously. So uh, again, it's, it's super early days. I, I probably would not go into a lot of detail here, but. You are kind of optimizing this kind of holistic optimization of the elements that you're um, showing in the feed. You know, to what degree are we also applying uh, AI to understand the individual elements that pop up in the feed and, you know, what are some of the pieces that come into that? Like I'm envisioning like, you know, applying models to images to understand which images are more engaging, applying NLP to, you know, headings and to try to understand which of those are more engaging. Are you, uh, do you think about it at all like that, like macro and micro type of? Yeah, I mean, it's to kind of like f the, we've spent most of our time thus far, like talking about like how we how we frame the optimization of like yeah. the overarching feed ecosystem, which is like a really tricky problem because of all these actors. Right. Um, then you have all the kind of like understanding that goes into the different features of the content. Uh, these are actually like features that are then put into that model to like mm -hmm. help us do a better job uh, actually predicting whatever target we're trying to predict. And so there's a lot of things we do on this front um, for for like text and image based content. We have, um, you know, we, we generate content embeddings um, to understand, um, let's say, like a text update and like how how text updates relate to themselves, uh, relate to each other, um, and uh, mapping that to like members' interests. Like, what have you read in the past? What is your what is on your profile? Where have you worked? Like, how does this content relate to your interests? Um, so we definitely use like neural net based techniques. Um, to generate embeddings there. Mm -hmm. can, um, can we drill into that for a second? Yeah, sure. uh, the, so we've talked quite a bit on the podcast in, in general about embeddings and the the idea that you can kind of map the set of you know content into some embedding space and then use that to determine you know where a new piece of content, what it's like and kind of related to the attributes of, uh, of other uh, content that you've already seen. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then when you're you are you mentioned relating that to the user, like how do you create the connection between this content embedding space and different users and user contexts? Yeah, so um let's talk mostly about just like the text based problem because I think that's it's a good example to start. Like any sure. any text based update. So um there's a lot of articles and posts that go into the LinkedIn feed that have text. Uh, every member profile is also heavily text-based. Um, we have like past work history. We have a job summary. We have a list of skills that a member has. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually uh, essentially create uh, a joint embedding space uh, for both members and articles where you are understanding uh, a particular token and uh, it's been it's been trained on on top of both both of these data sets right like member profiles and and articles so you're abstracting away from what the individual token represents whether it's a piece of content or a user or you know some uh entity in the yeah. economic graph to more you know it's some something that has a relationship with text in yeah. this broader context right. on the in this data set and so uh that's like at the token level right Okay. Um, the document then becomes the document that shows up in the feed, whether it be the article or whatever, or the member profile. Um, mm -hmm. And so you end up essentially creating like vector representations of, say, like a member profile or vector representations of uh, of whatever update type in the feed. And you can actually look at the similarity of these and say, like, you know, how much does this member care about this particular update? Is it is it relevant to their work history at all? And like, will it actually advance their professional career um, via providing this information? Or is it very tangential to their interests? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of, uh, that's like the the deep learned, like wide and deep nets used to like, you know, understand content. And we also go a much more like human in the loop uh, route. So we have a, a content understanding team in Dublin and um, that team is composed of linguists and engineers. And the linguists actually uh, created what we call like the interest graph, um, which is an ontology of interests, professional interests. Um, 
And there you actually have hierarchical relationships that are curated by, by linguists and taxonomists in terms of like how do these concepts relate to each other. Um, and this is particularly helpful when you have applications where you actually want to expose to the user like why you're seeing this. You know, like you're seeing this because you are interested in this particular topic um, and you want to display that. It's much more difficult to like reverse engineer an embedding and explain like, you know, mm -hmm. this is why you're seeing this. But with that ontology, it not only lets you um, kind of explain to the user why we're showing them, but it also, because of the hierarchical nature, it introduces a lot of interesting applications, right? Like you can you can back off to like more generality if you're getting like too specific, like if you're tagging it with, um, you know, uh, reinforcement learning, but you actually want to back off to just, let's say like machine learning or artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. you can do that up to the ontology. Um, and also uh, when, you go, when you go into problems like candidate selection and like what kinds of content you want to show members, um, if you do not have enough liquidity under a very granular node in this interest graph, you can back off and and you know go to to broader topics that are still related, um, but may have more inventory. Meaning people are writing more about that topic on LinkedIn, um, and so both those techniques in tandem are actually super helpful um, in understanding the content and then explaining to members, you know, why are we showing this to you in your feed? And so when you say both of them in tandem, are there? use cases where you use the ontology and use cases where you use the embeddings or are there ways that you uh, confuse them uh, for specific you know category of problems where that makes sense so we started with actually treating these individually as like separate features right so and they both showed that they provide unique value in terms of predicting whether members will participate in conversations um, but as our kind of thinking evolved these interest-based features can actually directly be uh, incorporated into the embedding, um, and you can uh, introduce even more like nonlinearity. That maybe the, like the humans have created a very strict structure to this ontology, and actually putting it directly in the embedding can actually uh, uncover even more relationships between these different interest nodes that we were not able to uncover just you know through curation. Um, so it's an evolution, right? Uh, you start mm -hmm. with kind of proving the value of both independently as like indiv individual feature sets within within your broader model. Um, and then you find ways to actually like have one help the other, for example, mm -hmm. like putting the, the interest graph-based features into the embedding. Um, and then they actually start complementing each other and start fusing into, into one broader content understanding feature. So I guess what I'm hearing you say is, you know, we're just talking about text. You take a piece of text and you map that to uh, the interest graph and then you stick that in the embedding as opposed to, I guess what I was thinking through was, it's natural for me to, to take a text piece of content and map it to like a topic that it's related to. It's less natural for me to map a person to a, a topic, but if the person is just a kind of a bag of text, then yeah. you can do that. You could do that. You can also look at like, what has the member uh, engaged with in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And you have the labeled data from the interest graph. And so you actually create this like uh, a vector representation, but not learned via like a neural net mm -hmm. um, of like what what interests in the interest graph does the member care about? Mm -hmm. um, and that's super helpful because it, it's actually much more understandable um, to the member. Like they understand like, okay, this is what you think my interests are. Uh, it's why you're recommending this piece of content to me. Um, so it's less about taking like their profile and and mapping it to the to the interest graph, and more about like looking at their historical behavior. What have they read on LinkedIn, um, and using the interest graph. So that's I think that's where like the more um, the ontology based technique, the the, the manual cur curation differs slightly from the the deep learning embeddings, where we can actually take the member's profile directly and and project it into the embedding space. So what are some of the other big challenges that you focus on uh, from a feed perspective? So yeah, we've kind of covered like you know optimization. I think there's like the, the, a lot of different uh, feature engineering that goes into understanding the content that's in the ecosystem. Um, and then I think the third, probably big one, is is foundations uh, in terms of how you empower your team to move fast um, yeah. and and run experiments. Um, I know you had Bi Chung Chen on like a previous podcast, and you were talking mm -hmm. a bit about ProML. Um, so feed obviously like you know it, it's 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 a really large vertical at LinkedIn and, and we want to experiment with a lot of different ideas. Um, and so we're running, you know, hundreds of, of AB tests every single quarter um, to figure out kind of how are we going to uh, activate members' professional communities and, and spark uh, professional conversations. Um, to do that, it's, you're kind of starting to go into the realm of using AI to make 
AI, like the AI team more productive, right? So it's mm-hmm. less about AI to optimize the business end of the equation and more AI to, to actually optimize engineering. Um, so what's a specific example of that? So I think um, starting from uh, automation, 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 like just uh, getting your models automatically deployed in production, mm-hmm. um, automatically identifying which variants you want to deploy to production, um, even identifying, uh, so something like feature engineering, which was like the bulk of work that I think we did in the industry, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, now a lot of that feature engineering can actually be just automatically, like that can be f- automatically explored mm-hmm. via like an AI, right? Uh, and when I say AI, I mean like you can probably like generate an embedding from a bunch of features that are available to you in, in a feature index and see which of those actually like make sense in, a, in advancing your objective. Mm-hmm. Um, that that no longer requires kind of a human in the loop for a lot of those problems. And so if you can automate some of the stuff like how you deploy models, uh, how you engineer f- like features or simpler features, yeah. you actually free up, you, you may like start automating 60% or 70% of what say an entry level engineer on the team would do. Um, and their time is freed up to think about these harder problems around um, optimization of the ecosystem and like how do they think about trade-offs and how do they automate those trade-off decisions that we were talking about uh, earlier when we're thinking about holistic optimization. So aut- automation is, is definitely... Uh, one of one of the key aspects here and then the other aspect is uh how do you make sure that uh you know you're constantly monitoring your model performance once stuff is online uh and that you are making sure your models don't uh rot kind of in the in the way we think of code rot um so you have systems that are like automatically retraining models like on sliding windows like every day um, on newer data and saying like, okay, this period of data actually is like not as good because, you know, something was wrong with the tracking data that was passed back to us. And then it might identify a new period and say, hey, this is actually a much better training data period. Let's actually, uh, let's actually ramp this in production. And so the system can now automatically retrain the models um, on newer data and also exploit that and, and, and push out to production in an automated way. These are all things that like historically engineers would all do manually. Um, and actually, like the the kind of com- competitive advantage to being a machine learning engineer was understanding this process end to end. And now, like I-, I think, a lot of what AI empowers and machine learning empowers is these kind of discovery uh, mechanisms of like which feature should I use in the model, which period of data should I retrain on, like all that is abstracted away from the engineer, and they focus on like the harder AI and machine learning challenges. I'm imagining that Feed is a big customer of ProML. Um, can you speak at all to the um, the relationship between um, kind of the customer of a platform and a platform? So we, we recently, uh, you may have seen uh, the interview with Bi Chung was in the context of a broader AI platforms series of podcasts uh, that we did. Um, and that was largely with kind of the you know the supply side, if yeah. you will, the folks that are providing those platforms. Um, but as a as a customer of those platforms, you know you are on the other side of you know a whole set of decisions that they're making around you know the degree to which the platform is opinionated versus not the degree to which. Um, well, a lot of the pl- a lot of the decisions kind of yeah. boil down to that, right? right. Um, what uh, what's your take on it from the other side? Yeah, so I I mean, it's a very uh, it's a very symbiotic relationship in the sense that you know we are giving a lot of requests to like what we want as a like capability to be enabled uh, for ProML. I think if you think about ProML as like the foundation uh, of of LinkedIn AI, mm-hmm. the first thing that ProML has to do is uh, handle the the average case, like the average path of how an engineer is getting something to production really well. Um, and so, so for some verticals that are starting to face unique challenges at scale, um, there's this relationship where we might identify a problem before another team has even identified it. And we pass that knowledge back to ProML and say, hey, you know, we're now realizing that, you know, we're having trouble, let's say, uh, uh, too, there's too many models being shipped to production and we need some way to like actually stage these in, in terms of how they get out there. Um, and we need to like rebase them automatically on top of each other. So like this is something that ProML may have not seen from other verticals just yet. Um, and then we will identify that problem, give that request back to them. Um, and they then build that out in terms of a platform capability that everybody can use. So it's really about, uh, I mean, ProML is, is essentially enabling a lot of the, the new directions that we want to go. 
um, through building the foundational infrastructure. If you want to build something like a, a GLM mix model and you want to start uh, introducing like decision trees into that, maybe that's not supported today. And maybe nobody has had a use case yet for that. Um, that's where the verticals, I think, really push the, the kind of horizontal pro ML initiative into thinking about how they shape their roadmap. Um, so, I mean, that's that's kind of it from a customer side. To what extent is there a tension there or is at least in, in the case of um, the way things are set up at LinkedIn, like is, is, do you do you end up having to make decisions when you're kind of pushing, you know, the edge and you're one of the bigger uh, customers, whether you kind of wait for the platform to deliver something oh, yeah. or you kind of build it yourself? And all, yeah, all the time. Do you end up with, you know, how do you manage, like I'm imagining kind of code debt kind of situations where, you know, you invest in some kind of, you know, the ability to to do things that you need, yeah. you know, eventually the platform catches up. And do you have kind of formalized thinking around this or mature thinking around this? Or do you kind of have to figure it out each time? Uh, I mean, I think we're still, I mean, like like, like I said, a lot of things at LinkedIn are still evolving. Uh, sure. So yeah. we, we covered a lot of things where we're, we're still learning. Like like I said, even like the holistic optimization, we yeah. started touching on reinforcement learning. And, and I was like, you know, we haven't really matured our thinking too far there. So you have to try something to like actually know whether it's warranted to invest in it like horizontally across all of ProML because that's going to be a, like building it in a scalable, horizontally leverageable, like abstracted way. That's that's a significant investment, right? Uh, you have to tailor not just to feed, but like a lot of different verticals, a lot of different use cases. Um, and so if we're proposing, if we're like, if we're pushing the boundary of, of techniques at LinkedIn or, or trying something new, you have to try it. And so oftentimes we won't wait for the platform, right? We will we will test it out and maybe it's not built in a generalizable way, but um, we actually have to prove that there's business value to what we are doing before we ask like a, a horizontal team to actually make this available across the board because there are many like foundational things that we could be building that will we, we know will apply you know, across verticals and maybe the particular technology we're building actually is only useful for feed. Um, and so... Um, or maybe it's only useful for feed for now, like for the for the next like you know year or two. Maybe like other teams just don't need it at this stage in in their life cycle because they're evolving down a different different path. Um, and so we do actually uh, within the feed AI team, we have a a foundations team that is separate from ProML, okay. and that team is completely geared towards. Uh, kind of empowering this fast iteration of like innovation and figuring out like what's working and what isn't. So we can go back to the ProML team and say like, hey, you know, we were we were trying to solve this problem. We found this technique that works. We built out like a prototype of the infrastructure that works for feed and this will scale. Like we think you should consider this as part of your roadmap to like roll out across all verticals. And that's what I meant when it's like a symbiotic relationship. Like uh, it's not like we can, uh, as an organization, wait for everything to be built perfectly horizontally. You have to push the boundaries in kind of like an agile and, and quick way. And you're right that that sometimes will generate some code debt. You'll have to, um, you know, pay it down at some point in the future. Um, I like. I'm of the opinion that like you know, technical debt is not. I think some people, some people avoid technical debt at all costs. Uh, technical debt is there so you can take on some debt to move faster. Obviously, you do not want your debt to like spiral out of control. Um, but if you're able to manage that in a, in a sane way, then like you're actually going to be pushing forward both the boundaries of your vertical, but also how fast ProML moves and discovers new opportunities that they should be making available horizontally. Are there things that come, that come to mind as a customer of a platform um, you know, independent of the specifics of the relationship between the ProML team and your team that you know, just as a customer, I want a platform team to be, you know, doing thing X, Y, Z or thinking, th you know, in way X, Y, Z. Like what are, what's your wish list for kind of that relationship, I guess? One of the unique things I think about how the AI org is 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 organized at LinkedIn is that it, it's completely centralized, right? Like you know, Deepak Agarwal has like all all the engineers working with AI report to him. There's like you know, 400 whatever engineers. Um, all the requests are very centralized, and all the teams work together like in a really uh, collaborative way. It's it never feels like we are a client asking like some remote team or like you know, a horizontal like platform provider to support us not definitely not in the way like you might if you if you're bootstrapping a startup today you'd go to AWS right and and might use their machine learning platform you you don't have like a direct path to ask them for like what you need um, this is all within the same team within the same company at LinkedIn where uh, we all kind of have a joint understanding of what our requests are so as a consumer uh, of ProML like I I think 
that there is, uh, like I said, there's that loop of innovation where like verticals kind of push the boundaries in areas where like maybe there's a unique problem in their domain that feeds back into the ProML platform. I don't think there's ever kind of a tension in terms of how, what we're asking for from the platform, um, which I mean, um, it's kind of rare and I think I mean, we're, we're fortunate to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. So kind of thing one on that list is just make sure to keep that collaborative loop tight and don't uh, kind of minimize the the barriers between kind of platform consumers yeah. and platform providers. And I think, I mean, you can take examples, I mean, just from my past, like, so AI at LinkedIn was not always like this centralized. So, you know, when, when Pulse was acquired, the Pulse relevance team was actually a separate team in a separate org, uh, not in the relevance org. Um, and the advantage there is that those AI engineers were embedded with like their product domain. And so like they completely understood the strategy. They were, they were uh, really close with all their other engineering partners, ha had really close relationships there. Um, the downside is that you can't tap into this like uh, giant wealth of knowledge and, and momentum uh, from like a centralized uh, AI org uh, in terms of all the kind of um, research that's going on foundationally, new techniques, like you're only a team of maybe like three or four embedded engineers in a product vertical when you have the distributed model. And that makes it much more difficult to tap into like uh, that that knowledge base um, that we have in, in today's model. So it, it is like really important how you set up your organization to make sure you're maximizing the value and the uh, the feedback that's going to the horizontal platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and along those lines is the AI org exclusively centralized or do you have kind of a, you know, I'll, I'll talk to folks that embrace more of like a hub and spoke model where yeah. they'll, yeah. you know, there's a centralized org that is, um, you know, defining, you know, best practices, if you will, building tooling and platform, um, you know, but also like embedding uh, data scientists, machine learning engineers within product teams, you know, for periods of time to help them uh, deliver features? Like, how does that manifest itself at LinkedIn? It's definitely not exclusively centralized. Like, I work very closely with our product feed product team, work very closely with, like, our feed consumer engineering partners that are building, like, the mobile clients. I mean, you have to be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's kind of, like, a, a virtual team that, that works on that particular product area. And that's usually how, I, I guess, uh, hub and spoke model might be, might be kind of the right analogy here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really, it depends on like a vertical's needs. And so it differs yeah. but from vertical to vertical. At the end of the day though, like um, let's say you don't even have a well fleshed out like product team or product mm -hmm. counterpart. Um, what this kind of centraliz centralization within the AI org offers is you can actually bootstrap something using the wealth of knowledge and techniques that are like already at your fingertips from like ProML and all these other um, verticals yeah. um, without starting from scratch embedding with like a brand new product like you would at maybe a startup. And so it's not exclusively centralized in the sense that like, we obviously collaborate with our partners, but uh, there is a great de degree of centralization that enables collaboration across the org. As we're kind of following this thread around, you know, organizational themes uh, and, and kind of platform providers, consumers, like any other thoughts for folks that are maybe earlier on in this path than LinkedIn, um, things that have helped you be successful? There's so much kind of fragmentation in the like cloud machine learning offerings in the industry now. So like, I'm not really going to go into that in terms of how you might build like a machine learning shop from scratch. But I do think that uh, actually like the important lesson going back to what we were talking about earlier is really understanding how you formulate your problem early on. Um, and I think this is actually something now looking back at Pulse that like we may have been really short sighted by like focusing on like, you know, this day's revenue or like this day's engagement and not focusing on the like more holistic picture of like, what is your ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Define your problem space and then understand both the short term and long term effects and how they trade off with each other. Um, and I think, you know, coming from a startup, oftentimes you're very focused on that like short term milestone. And you actually might be sacrificing a lot of long-term growth and, and engagement mm -hmm. by by going by by not taking time and saying, like, let's actually think about how we're using machine learning to solve this problem. Um, it's very easy to be a machine learning expert these days and kind of like find a tutorial to do like solve the exact problem that you're trying to solve for your startup. Um, and I think the real like value of machine learning is when you actually give it a harder problem than those that you see, like like the simple problem that you've thought of, like we need to solve this particular like ranking problem uh, mm -hmm. for like a feed. Uh, thinking more about all the actors in your ecosystem, all the different content types, all the different intents, and 
pushing the boundary of like what machine learning can help you do. Um, I think that's probably the most useful insight going from a small startup to a big company where we actually have had much more um, time to think through those different components. You know, in some ways it's like jumping to the end game. Can you do that without like going through the the steps? Like what's the, or is there an approach to getting you there or a way of thinking about it that allows you to know which of the steps you need to yeah. skip versus what what you have to pass through? Yeah, your point is like spot on, which is like it's easy to identify like this as as uh, as something you should do when you've already like evolved to this point in terms <laughs> of your te- technical capability. But actually, um, I think it's always useful to evaluate kind of like uh, how far AI has come and how easy it is now to like do a lot of really fundamental and basic like things, solve a lot of like the simpler problems in AI. When I was saying like you know automating all these kind of basic capabilities within our team. A lot of that is offered on like uh, a lot of different like cloud platforms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, And so folks that want to use machine learning are actually kind of freed up now from some of those lower level logistics. And you can kind of skip a few steps ahead. You know, uh, if you go to the very beginning of LinkedIn, we were still like trying to get like logistic regression working for like a CTR based model. We had to start with like recency based model. You don't actually have to do that anymore, right? Out the gate, you can actually uh, start with kind of what is pretty state of the art uh, in the industry. And I think that's why it's it's so important to spend that extra time um, thinking through your ecosystem. Like, what is it you're building? Uh, what are the levers you have at your disposal uh, in your product to actually uh, to to shape the product experience you're trying to build? Um, and so, I, I do think that like the the advancements in ML and AI, kind of over the last decade, like it's gotten easy enough to do that you're actually maybe not burdened by some of the stuff that, you know, LinkedIn had to deal with or Pulse had to deal with in the really early days when like the tooling was not nearly the way it is today. Um, The kinds of technologies that were available out of the box in terms of how you use neural nets, I mean, even TensorFlow, like that's something that I think in the last really five to seven years has really blown up as like, you know, standard tooling. And uh, that is all now available to any anybody bootstrapping a product out of the box. Um, so you can skip that. Uh, you can skip that. And LinkedIn did spend a lot of time in, in that that area. Um, and you can start moving into like these pr- problem definition type uh, scenarios. So invest the uh, time and, and energy saved in building out kind of core infrastructure and being yeah. more thoughtful about the way you approach the value you're trying yeah. to deliver to whoever the customer is. I think you summarized it much more articulately than, than I did, but yeah, that's uh, spot on. It's yeah. a great point. It's a great point. Well, Tim, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me. It's a great, a great conversation and I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. For more information on Tim or any of the topics covered in this episode, visit twimmelaicom slash talk slash 224. Thanks again to LinkedIn for their support of this show. Be sure to check out what their engineering team is up to at engineering.linkedin.com slash blog. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.